aerodynamics and how they take off and how they survive. And uh, recently you had all these locusts. Yes. And this is so amazing. It's just a coincidence, but uh, how they are able to travel such long distances, even though they are so little, mini, some of them, but locusts, however, are quite big. Yes, yes. Sanjay is Dr. Yeah. Usha Mukundan, our present director of academic affairs, uh, and she was past principal. And she's uh -huh. also she's a botanist. Oh, very nice. <laughs> and we we do like insects when they are pollinators. Otherwise, uh -huh. we don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, this year is it's international yeah, year of plant health. Oh yes. Okay. Well, I hope I can change your mind about otherwise no, no, no. like mean, insects. We love them. <laughs> See, in an ecosystem, you have to balance. They're equally uh, required. So, Madam, we'll start. Yes, yes, yes. Madam. Please yeah. uh, requesting you to welcome the participants yeah. here. So, good evening, yeah. uh, each one of you. And it's always a pleasure. Uh, physics is something which is very fascinating, but at the same time, quite scary also. Uh, but uh, looking at a youngster, uh, Dr. Sanjay Sani, who's going to take us on a flight using uh, insects. And I'm very sure he is, he's going to give more details. And uh, I'm eagerly looking forward to listening to you. And welcome to, even though it's virtual, the Junjunwala College family. And we would also like to thank the IAPT Mumbai chapter for giving us this uh, very unique opportunity for this uh, month uh, this entire month, we say, uh, is dedicated to you, genius physicist. And uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, we have a very sumptuous meal of uh, very good lectures that we have been listening. But today's has been more special because it concerns us. And uh, we biologists would like to see how you interpret uh, the aerodynamics of insects and how they are able to uh, fly long distances and how they manage. So with these words, I extend a very warm welcome to each one of you and looking forward to listening to you. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation and to be with us today evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Uh, uh, may I request uh, for, uh, Mr. Amit from IAPT Mumbai Subregional Council. Amit Mori, please uh, say something about the IAPT. Yeah. Uh, good evening to all present here on behalf of IAPT Mumbai Sub Regional Council. I welcome our today's speaker, Dr. Sanjay Sane, sir, and all the participants here. Uh, as many of you know, IAPT is Indian Association of Physics Teachers, was established in the year 1984 by the great visionary late Dr. D.P. Kandelwal with the aim of upgrading the quality of physics teaching and physics teachers at all levels. Uh, it's now a major organization with more than 6,500 live uh, members and spread over uh, about 1,500 organizations throughout the country, including about 100 members from the abroad. Uh, Mumbai sub -RC is very much up to its call and has been very actively organizing various events like workshop on the innovative experiments for the uh, uh, junior college teachers, uh, summer schools for the undergraduate students, lecture series in the cutting edge uh, physics, etc. Uh, though we all are going through a tough time due to this current pandemic, but there is always zeal for knowledge. And knowing this fact, IPT Mumbai uh, SRC has organized such a wonderful lecture series. Today is the seventh lecture uh, in the series, and I'm sure you all will enjoy it. Uh, over to Rekha, madam. Yeah, thank you, thank Amit. You. Uh, I would just like to add a few things uh, from this thing. Just uh, IAPT also conducts some prestigious competitions. Uh, three of them, I would like to make the announcement because they are already announced in the bulletin right this particular week. Uh, IAPT conducts national competition for innovative experiment for physics for the teachers as well as the students and all physics lovers. Any physics lover can take part in this competition. So it's a competition for innovative experiment in physics. Uh, the uh, second competition is national competition for innovative experiment in computational physics. 
and the third competition is national competition in essay writing in physics these three competitions are a very prestigious competitions with a good prize money of course first prize 5000 rupees second prize like 2000 rupees 3000 and third as 2000 we are now actually thinking of even increasing the prize money the notification has already come on iipt website and those who are interested in fact uh, please uh, please uh, circulate these notices among your colleagues and among your students and motivate them to participate in a large number thank you so much now may i invite my colleague dr vaishali raikwar to please introduce our today's guest uh, vaishali please yeah thank you madam uh, good evening all it's my proud privilege to introduce dr sanjay sane from uh, national center for biological sciences tifr bangalore dr sane received his bachelor's degree in physics chemistry and mathematics from st stephen's college university of delhi in 1991 and a master's degree in physics from the university of pune in 1993 he then decided to shift to biology and joined tifr's biological sciences group as a junior research fellow after a year he moved to the usa and in 2001 he received his phd from university of california berkeley from michael dickinson's lab following post doctoral work with tom daniel at Univ uh, university of washington during 2002 to 2007 dr sane returned to bangalore as a faculty member of national center for biological sciences he is the recipient of ramanujan fellowship 2009 his laboratory focuses on a wide range of questions from the physics to the physiology of semi uh, sensory motor processes underlying insect wing movements during flight uh, it's quite interesting uh, more recently his laboratory has also been investigating insect architecture and collective behavior in termites and also plant biomechanics dr sane became an editor of journal of experimental biology in 2020 he is also a review editor at frontiers in neural circuits and is on the editorial boards of biological biology letters journal of neurophysiology journal of bionic engineering etc his areas of expertise are insect flight organismal biomechanics and biofluid mechanics neuroethology collective behavior in insects and other animals plant biomechanics sensory neurobiology specifically mechano sensation vision and olfaction certainly his career path uh, should inspire physics students and add to their repertoire one more possible avenue after a degree in physics i would like to request the participants to kindly mute their microphones and if you want to ask question please write it in the chat box all the questions will be answered at the end of the session now i would like to request uh, dr sane to start his presentation over to you sir thank you thank you very much uh, this is uh, i i really wish i could have uh, come there in person but maybe some other time when things are more normal uh it is uh, a great pleasure to see some familiar faces uh in the audience and uh, i am really uh happy to be able to talk to you about some of the work that uh, we have done in the past and also a little bit about uh, the field itself um so this uh, just to do, begin with this is uh, a, a sort of a simple introduction to ncbs uh, the place where i work uh, this is a very old picture uh i i put it there more for nostalgic value than anything the there is uh, a large and you have to share your slides again and oh is it yeah uh let me see okay i'm stuck i'm not able to get out of this uh for some reason i'm not able to get out of this uh presentation you cannot see my slides at all no okay no no like, um i will have to unfortunately um restart my computer because it doesn't look like uh, i am able to get out of this uh, normally an escape button should do the trick but uh, i'm not able to do that um so I, i'll just be back in a little bit 
Yeah, you can go uh, zoom uh, rejoin. Maybe yeah, I'll, I'll just rejoin. Yeah, I'll, I'll just do that. Oh, huh, it's interesting. Okay, I'm back. Um, and uh, oh, I should also. Share computer dot your. How do I share computer audio? Uh, right down. Uh, right side down. Oh, in the security. No. Post. I don't see it. Did you first share it? First share your. Uh, oh, I first share my slides. Okay. Uh, Okay, you can see this. Yes. And I uh, share computer sound. Okay. okay. I hope this works now. Yes. Yeah. So, can you see this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, as I was saying, uh, this is a somewhat uh, dated picture of uh, my inst uh, institute. Sorry. Um, there is a large building now in the back here. Uh, and uh, but this is the front part and my lab is somewhere there. Uh, and for more than a decade now, my lab has been looking at um, insect flight uh, more from the nervous system perspective. Although much of what I'm going to tell you about uh, in this talk happened uh, well before then. So this is uh, work that I did uh, as a PhD student when I was still uh, sort of transitioning from physics into biology. So 
in a sense, this talk uh, bookends two different parts of my uh, of my uh, academic life. One which is the very early part, and one which is more recent. So I will uh, try and talk to you about both of these um, in the next hour or so. So let me start by showing you a very simple movie. This is a scene that you've seen uh, hundreds of times, I'm sure. Uh, it happens all around us all the time. Uh, but what we do is uh, record uh, the scene with uh, something called a high-speed video camera. And this uh, is a camera that is able to film at substantially higher rates uh, than your normal video camera, which is roughly 25 frames per second. Uh, this particular film was taken at about 3,000 frames a second. And when you do that, you start to see the beauty uh, of insect flight and, and the, the intricacy and, and the, the most precise way in which flies fly. Now I should give you some basics before I show you this film. What, you, what you're seeing is a common house fly. You see these all around, uh, uh, you know, this, this is a fly that's seen all the time um, in canteens, everywhere. Uh, this, insect flies uh, flaps its wings at 200 to 250 times a second. If you uh, recall, you will not have seen its wings in motion. That's because they're flapping too fast and we are uh, too slow in our ability to uh, see it. But when you slow it down, you begin to see just how intricate the wing motion is. I'm just going to play this. Uh, and what I want you to notice is that this insect is going to come and it's going to land on this particular spot. Now watch the wings as they are making many small and intricate adjustments as this insect goes and lands on this uh, particular square. I'm going to show you this movie again. Now notice that it's fully aware that it's going to land. Uh, its legs are extended and it is able to carry out this very precise maneuver, which you know, as engineers, we are extremely envious of because it's very hard to recreate such uh, precise motion. And so uh, for the longest time, people have been wondering how insects are able to do something this precise, this intricate in such fast time scales. You know, how is it able, the whole film that you saw happens in literally a fraction of a eye blink. Uh, our eyes blink at about, you know, 200 milliseconds, about uh, five hertz or so. And this thing is at least uh, 10 times faster than that. So, so you know, uh, I mean, the whole behavior. So how is it that uh, insects are able to do this uh, in such short time scales? And this is really the question that I started out with many years ago. I'm being fascinated by, you know, how uh, insects observe the world around them. How do they, you know, respond to that world in uh, the precise time scales that it did? Uh, the early questions I had uh, were more to do with how insects fly in the first place. You know, how do they even generate enough um, forces with their flapping wings to be able to fly? And as it turned out, this was a long-standing question that uh, you know had had been um, very much an open question uh, at least when I started my PhD. Uh, and we uh, set out to try and answer this question. And in the first part of the talk, I'm just going to tell you about how we uh, went about <coughs> answering this question. <clears throat> That's the physics part. Now, everything you just saw happened in maybe 50 milliseconds or so, okay? The, the entire uh, landing behavior was, was in, in, as I said, in a fraction of an eye blink. But let's consider the other extreme of what insects can do. So what I've shown you here are two, two insects. This is uh, 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 what, what is often called a globetrotter, uh, a dragonfly that many of you have seen uh, in, in Mumbai flying out. So this is uh, the, the Western coast of India. And you've seen these dragonflies fly out of uh, towards the sea. Uh, I don't know if, if many people have, have been able to witness this amazing 
event. And as we have recently discovered, we meaning uh, uh, a, an ecologist from Maldives has recently discovered um, these dragonflies are flying or may very well be flying all the way to the eastern coast of Africa. Uh, so, you know, Maldives are here and what, uh, uh, what was noticed was that, uh, you know, some errant dragonflies tended to land here. There are, there's no freshwater sources here. So uh, it wasn't clear why, um, why this was happening. Uh, and then uh, when they started to track, you know, when the dragonflies were leaving, when they were arriving here, when they were arriving in Seychelles, and when they were arriving on the eastern coast of Africa, to, much to their surprise and the surprise of all of us in the field, uh, the dragonflies seem to be making these uh, journeys, really long journeys across. The most celebrated example of uh, long distance migration is the monarch butterfly. Uh, many of you must have heard of uh, monarch butterflies. And as you know, that they start out in Mexico and then they, there's a batch of them that fly towards uh, the west coast of the United States and another batch that flies uh, towards the east coast. And there they spend a few generations before uh, migrating back. And uh, it's an extraordinary event. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, this towards the end of the talk. Uh, from the perspective of conservation and the fact that is these populations are dwindling. Um, so at both ends, insects amaze us. You know, on, on the one hand, they're extremely fast. They're very, very uh, precise in their motions and they're able to do things that uh, as engineers, we can hardly even dream of doing right now. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, they are able to do these long, duration flights, uh, sometimes across thousands of kilometers, and uh, they're able to survive these arduous journeys. Uh, so there's something really amazing about them. Now, why should we be interested in this? Well, for many reasons. First of all, by any metric that you can think of, insects are the most successful uh, multicellular animals that we know about. What I'm showing you here is a, uh, is, a, is a chart of all life, more or less. And the way one looks at this, if, uh, if you haven't seen charts like this before, is that this is uh, what, what they call a phylogeny. And all of the animals are laid out around the uh, circumference of this circle. And as you can see, a good half of them, as you can see here, are insects, okay? This is all life. And, Insects occupy uh, half of this chart, more than half of this chart, actually. Um, and then the rest, of course, there's a la large number of uh, arthropods, uh, things that are from which insects have evolved, so uh, invertebrates. And then uh, we are a very small portion of it. We are right here. Uh, a very small portion, and we are part of something called deuterostomes. Uh, and we are even a very tiny part of that. So it's really important for us to realize that we live in the world of insects, not the other way around. That they've been here long before us. There are an estimate six to 10 million species, um, and of which more than 1 million are already described. They're more than 80% of all multicellular animals. They may be. Uh, by estimates, uh, and they range in size scales that are astonishing uh, by any amount, and I, I will also talk about that a bit. They occupy virtually every ecological niche that we know. Uh, they're there on the highest of mountains, they're there in the coldest of places, um, and they've been around uh, for nearly 400 million years. So they've been here uh, long before us, quite likely they'll be here long after us. And they are an absolutely essential part of the ecosystem. And without them, the ecosystems will simply collapse. And I'll talk about that towards the end. One of the more astonishing things about insects, uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
is the fact that they occupy three orders of magnitude uh, in size scales. Uh, on your left here uh, is a fossil of the largest insect ever found. It's a meganeurid dragonfly. And this dragonfly had a wingspan. So from, from one tip of the wing to another tip was almost two feet, a little more than two feet. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's a really large dragonfly. And this is from the Carboniferous period about 300 million years ago, now extinct. But if you look at the ins of the insects that are even around today, the largest insect is something called the Queen Alexandra's birdwing. Uh, we have a close relative of this uh, birdwing in India. It's called the Southern birdwing. And uh, that too is, uh, I think that's the largest insect to be found in India. And that has a wingspan of about uh, one, uh, one foot. At the other end of the spectrum is this little fly, little wasp actually, called Megaphragma uh, mymaripen, which if you can see this uh, scale bar is about 200 microns in size. So small that there are some single cells that are larger than this uh, wasp, okay? That is how small this is. Yet, as you can see, it has eyes, it has uh, fairly nice antennae, uh, it has a thorax, an abdomen, three pairs of legs, and wings that uh, look like rather like combs. Um, and you know, they, there's a reason that uh, that doesn't matter for them, they can still fly. So this is, you know, by any, by any stretch of the imagination, an astonishing size scale to inhabit and to be able to fly across all these time scales. And also, uh, we should be aware that flight is one of the key reasons why insects are as successful as they are, uh, because they flight is what allows them to occupy all of these different uh, ecological niches. So that's just by way of uh, telling you why we are so interested in flight. We think it's one of the most important biological phenomena to have evolved. We think it's the primary reason behind the success of insects, the spectacular evolutionary success of insects. And uh, it is, from a physics perspective, uh, a really interesting problem because it occupies all these different size scales and it's able to work so well uh, despite it. And not all of the answers we know uh, uh, to the questions of, for instance, how do they use energy over long distance flight, et cetera. But there's many that we've been able to finally address uh, uh, over the course of the last about three or four decades. So uh, here's the outline of my talk. And in the first part, I'll tell you a little bit about the physics of flight, uh, particularly focusing on how uh, we've been able to bring this problem to the lab and study it. And in the second part, I will talk about more recent work about how the flight machinery works. In other words, how are their bodies configured and how does uh, the flight machinery work, okay? So let us think of what insect wings are, okay? At the heart, as you know, insect wings flap. Uh, and when I say flap, I mean that they uh, they move from one end to the other and then move back. Uh, so they don't rotate like a propeller, but early engineers uh, were you know, not able to visualize the motion of the wing. It was so fast and you needed really good visualization tools and they, those didn't exist at the time. Uh, and so they were sort of more um, focused on trying to understand just you know, what kind of theory can work to explain insect flight. And so, uh, you know, when I'm talking about um, engineers in the early part uh, of the last century, when, um, you know, post Wright brothers, once we had a really good idea of how, um, how to get uh, machines airborne, 
but also uh, the invention of helicopters and, and propeller-based flight. Parallel to that, there was a extraordinary um, movement in physics, uh, work of people like Prantil uh, and Tijens and many others who uh, established how the basic theory of flight works. One of the uh, key models in that was something called the actuator disk model. The actuator disk, if you can just imagine, uh, is a, a disk that pulses periodically. And as it pulses, it pulls air from the top and pushes it down. Uh, and that particular wake structure has properties that you can then kind of, uh, you know, theoretically study. Um, so this is the way that uh, this, these were the kinds of models that were used uh, in the early uh, part of you know, insect flight research. But at the heart of it, one can imagine the insect wing or, or I mean flight, basically what is it? It is, you know, imagine that this is the cross section of the wing. This is the leading edge. This is the trailing edge. Uh, can you see my pointer at all? Yes, we can see. Okay, good. Uh, so, so, so this is the leading edge. This is the trailing edge. And what the wing does, and this is a flat plate. This is not an insect wing is fundamentally different from an aeroplane wing. The aeroplane wing isn't a flat plate. It, is, uh, it has the shape of an airfoil, uh, but this is a flat plate. And so what happens is um, as it moves through the air, it encounters uh, Air and it pushes it down. So there's a change in the net momentum flux. And as a result of that, there is a force which acts normal to the surface of the wing. Okay. One part of the force is what uh, we call lift. And this is the one that actually offsets the weight of the insect and allows them to fly. The other part is called the drag, which is essentially something that the insect has to deal with. Uh, it, you know, it, it resists uh, the motion of the wing going forward. So on the one hand, this is what, you know, we, we have uh, with the insect wing and what the models that were being used were more sort of these actuated disc models where you had these pulsed uh, um, bursts of uh, flow. And what you could then do was measure the flow, you know, somewhere down here, uh, where you could then ask, uh, you know, what the what the properties of the flow are. Does it, you know, uh, does it actually work with the model, etc. Now the problem with the actuator disk model is that the average wake analysis ignore what is happening in the near field. Everything gets averaged out here, so you don't get a, a good sense of what is happening as a function of time, uh, how forces are being generated, et cetera. Everything just uh, gets um, mixed up, uh, so to speak. Nevertheless, these, these kind of analysis were very influential in, in early analysis of insect flight. And, you know, they, but soon the realization came that, you know, this, these kind of models wouldn't go very far and that we had to get back to the picture of how forces were generated at the instantaneous basis. So one of the methods that was developed at the time, uh, initially by people like Tokel Weisfolk, uh, and then his graduate student Ellington, uh, who passed away very recently, uh, one, of the, one of the great uh, leaders in the field, uh, they suggested uh, these uh, models called the quasi-steady models. Now, let me try and explain what these models are. So imagine that you've kept a uh, wing uh, inclined in a, some wind tunnel of some kind. So there's flow that is encountered by this wing, uh, which generates uh, a net force. Now, if this wing were there for, let's say, infinite time, then eventually the force would be steady. Uh, you would get one value of the force, and then you could plug that in uh, to uh, the configuration that you saw. So 
what you see here is a silhouette of the insect and the wing as it moves. This is the flapping as it is occurring. So the wing starts here. You, remember, you're seeing the cross section of the wing. And again, the circle is the leading edge. Now the wing starts here, moves forward, and then flips and comes back. Okay, so this is the downstroke. This is the upstroke. Now in a quasi-steady model, what you do is you take snapshots of this wing. Okay, so imagine that each one of this is a snapshot. Okay, now you take the wing in that configuration, you place it in this wind tunnel, you measure the force, and you transplant the force arrow here. Okay, the measured force. And what you get then is a quasi-steady uh, picture of uh, how force evolves as a function of time. Now, this is uh, this mo model was really important uh, in the early stages because we really didn't know very much about the history of how forces evolve, okay? which is sort of the, uh, you know, it required better measurements and so on. Um, one of the things that Weiss folk did uh, when he was a professor at Cambridge uh, was initiate a program in which he began to take high speed films, these were cine films, of a large number of insects. Okay. And so he, he had a whole survey of them. And from this survey emerged some extraordinary um, uh, results that I cannot talk too much about, I don't have the time, but uh, a lot of this data was analyzed by Ellington, uh, who generated his own data, of course, and uh, he was a student of Weiss folks. Uh, and he essentially took all of this information and analyzed it and asked the simple question, do quasi-steady models work? Okay. Now, one of the things that uh, I have to tell you is that you know, in, in this situation, if you have a wing uh, inclined relative to flow, flow and you measure the force on it, so lift and drag, then you can plot that force, okay, as a function of the angle of attack. Now, the angle of attack is the angle that this plate makes with the uh, direction of the flow, okay? So that's alpha. So it goes from zero to 90. If you can imagine, normally I would show this with my hand, but I, I, I just have to sort of explain in words. Um, so if you can imagine that the the uh, wing is aligned with the flow, then it's go not going to generate any lift, right? And it's not going to generate any drag either. And so those values would both be zero. That's right at zero angle over time. If the wing were inclined roughly as I'm showing them here, then you should see more or less equal lift and drag. And so that's uh, sort of right around here. Um, but then as the wing continues to move up and now it's facing the full flow, uh, not inclined, but uh, vertically, then again, lift force will go down because that component of the force goes down and all of the force becomes drag. And so what you see is a, a two curves, one is, uh, the force increases and then decreases as angle of attack increases, whereas the drag continues to monotonically increase. Okay. Now what we do then is we take the force and we divide it. So this is the lift force and we divide it by uh, uh, certain parameters. So the density of the medium is one, uh, the square of the velocity of the wing, and the surface projected surface area. And when you do that, uh, this quantity called the coefficient of lift uh, comes out. This is non-dimensional. And the big advantage of working this way is to make sure that you can work across scales, which means that you, know, you can uh, sort of simulate uh, the small insect wing with a sort of a large model, uh, provided uh, you make sure that uh, you know, certain things are kept you know, the flow environment is kept uh, the same. Um, so for the longest, the, the main answer that Sir sort of Ellington came up with uh, was that the quasi-steady modeling doesn't quite work, okay? That if you have coefficients that go from zero to a little less than one to 90, and these are typical of what you would see 
also in uh, aircraft literature, uh, then you know they this is simply not sufficient to uh, explain the flight of insects. Okay, uh, many of you might have heard of this so-called bumblebee paradox. The idea that uh, you know that engineers sort of did back of the envelope calculations of whether bumblebees could fly, and they found out bumblebees can't fly, uh, and but the bumblebees don't care and they fly anyway. Uh, and it led to this paradox, uh, which was kind of an annoying paradox for the longest time, because uh, you know uh, it was clear that you know the models were insufficient and the theory was not ripe, and most importantly, uh, there was something lacking in the measurements. So. Uh, what we decided to do, and this is now when I uh, joined Berkeley, uh, my, uh, my advisor, Michael Dickinson, uh, a postdoc in the lab, Fritz Olaf Lehmann and I, uh, we uh, decided to work on this problem uh, using a different method than the one that I just described. And what we uh, wanted to do uh, was, um, build a device uh, in which we, this is called a flapper. It's, it was, it got the name of RoboFly uh, for reasons that uh, not, I, I, I don't want to go into. It's not really a robot. What it is, is a flapper, okay? It's a, a feed forward device in which uh, there is a hinge. The hinge is able to move a wing back and forth and it can uh, also rotate the wing so that this wing can perform pretty much any uh, wing movement that you can measure uh, in uh, freely flying flies. And by the time we were ready to do this, you know, there were also uh, measurements uh, of actual 3D motion of uh, insect wings. Now, one of the things that we did was um, uh, use a, a force measurement device uh, this is a 2D force sensor that is able to measure the forces normal and uh, parallel to the wing. And from these, we could reconstruct uh, lift and drag. So this particular device was uh, a scaled up device. It's called a dynamically scaled model of an insect. Uh, and what we had to do was make sure that uh, we conserved the Reynolds number. And by Reynolds number, I mean the ratio of the inertial to the viscous forces. So you know they have a certain value in insects, and we wanted to make sure that we preserved that value so that the flow uh, around this uh, insect wing uh, was uh, the same uh, around this model wing was the same as that around an insect wing. Okay. Um, there is a yellow line. I think this is. Uh, I don't know why this is there. If we can. Uh, let's see, clear, clear all right. okay, maybe I did it. Um, okay, so now let's think about what inputs uh, to give this, this fly, okay? So, so we have this device and it's controlled by uh, three stepper motors that basically move each wing. There are two wings, so we have the whole fly. And in order to conserve the Reynolds number, we had to take this entire device Okay, so the, the length of this was about 25 centimeters. The length of a fly that it was modeling, uh, the wing of the fly was about 2.5 millimeters. So it was, you know, being uh, substantially scaled up. Um, now, what we need to do, needed to do was put through the uh, stepper motors, uh, the proper motion of the fly. And, uh, you know, this, this, uh, in, in more recent times can be very easily uh, sort of done because we have now the advantage of some extraordinarily uh, good high-speed video cameras. And so I'm just going to show you a movie in which uh, I can show you how this is done. And this is not exactly how we did it. We, we got the data from the literature, but this is how we do it now. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the, uh, a fly that is landing uh, on, on this particular vertical surface. And what we've done is digitize the wing so you can see 
how the wings move. And these angles are then uh, plotted. Uh, so there are three Euler angles uh, that completely describe how the wing moves. And uh, there is also body angles, how this body is uh, oriented relative to the surface. So, so as you can see, both wings move in perfect synchrony. Uh, each of these plots is actually two lines, but they're moving in perfect synchrony. So they're right on top of each other. But notice as it comes close to the surface, the, the synchrony looks like it's breaking, okay? The amplitude of the wing goes down and the lines separate here and then the uh, fly lands, okay? So what we get from here are all the inputs that we require to put into this device. And then we, uh, then we take this device and we dunk it into a large vat of mineral oil. So this is the big mineral oil. But this is the uh, Robofly. Uh, these are the three uh, stepper motors for each wing and the force sensor. And what we then do is uh, run this whole thing, measure the forces. This is uh, a video of the probably the first run of this fly when everything was started working. This is now way back, uh, nearly 20 years back, a little more than 20 years back, in fact. And so you can see how this thing moves. Now notice there's this swirly white thing here and that's uh, mineral oil. Uh, so this is a vat of mineral oil in which we've introduced bubbles. And those bubbles are uh, allow you to actually see what's happening with the flow, okay? So we weren't content with just sort of measuring the forces. We also wanted to know what's happening with the flow. I, I'll play this movie again. Uh, and you can already start to see certain vortices uh, build up and uh, I will be talking about them shortly. Uh, this is a more modern version of the device. And what we do is we uh, throw a laser sheet across so that we can visualize these bubbles and we very quickly flash these, uh, the laser beam. So you, you see the, uh, the movement of the flow as essentially dots, a configuration of dots, and you take quick pictures and you ask how much do the dots move in each, each picture. And from that, you can get something called a particle image velocimetry. Uh, you can actually visualize the flow and you get uh, extraordinary measurements of the flow fields. If you look very closely at both these images, uh, these are, uh, you know, there are arrows and each arrow tells you in which direction uh, the flow is moving and with what speed. Now, uh, notice already some very interesting things. So here's the wing from the top. There's a laser sheet thrown across a camera that's, uh, you know, as uh, taking quick pictures and we then decide which uh, part of the wing to illuminate. And then we um, compare uh, and make the bubbles. So this is the velocity field and we take the curl of this field and we get uh, the vorticity field here. And you can immediately see that there are structures around the wing mo movement. And this is uh, one such structure. It's, a, it's the leading edge vortex about which I'll tell you in a little bit. And you can see that there is another vortex that is uh, the stopping vortex uh, in, in this way. So what did we learn from the forces? Well, the forces were kind of interesting because they were telling us a very different story about uh, what was going on. Now, remember that the measurements that I told you about where you put keep a wing in a, uh, in a wind tunnel kind of thing, where, and what we were measuring was a flapping wing. So were the forces any different? But turns out they were actually very, very different. In a flapping wing, uh, as when the wing started and began to move, you could see the initial force transients, this is left, and then the, uh, there's some, um, some reason there is annotation going on, uh, which I don't want, okay. So there's this going on, and so as you can see, um, 
there is a um, the, the force transients happen and then the force stabilizes. The fact that the force stabilizes like this was extremely surprising because the wing is moving at very high angles of attack. You will never see an aeroplane wing move at such high angles of attack. And the reason it doesn't move at such high angles of attack, you know, we're talking about 40 degrees, 36 degrees, and so on. Aeroplane uh, wings, you know, are usually in the few degrees. Okay. If they were to move at such high angles of attack, the wing would stall, meaning that the force would fluctuate wildly. It wouldn't be so steady as you see here. Okay. The fact that it was steady was extremely surprising and it was very clearly a unique feature of flapping fly. Okay. Let's look at what the lift and drag coefficients tell us. Now, remember that in the diagram that I showed you before, lift and drag were both under one, but when we measured the lift and drag coefficients for a flapping wing, these were extraordinarily high, okay? So lift coefficients were, you know, close, close to 1.6, 1.7, and drag coefficients went up to 3.5, extraordinarily high. So what that means is that very high force is being generated, and not just is it being generated, but it is being sustained over a long period of time. The wing isn't stalling, it doesn't shed vortices, somehow it is being able to keep that force going for a long time. That is what is unique about flapping flight. How does this happen? The answer to this came uh, from uh, Charlie Ellington, uh, who I just mentioned a few, few slides ago. Uh, he passed away last year, but he was one of the, the greats uh, in the field and he, uh, performed similar flapper experiments uh, in 96, where he showed that there was a leading edge vortex that he visualized uh, at the leading edge of the wing. And this vortex was convecting from uh, the base of the wing to the tip of the wing. And so what was happening was that this vortex never grew in size. So it never became unstable. It stayed small, but stable and was able to sustain over a longer period of time. And this is what he argued was uh, keeping the wing, uh, you know, um, generating high lift coefficients as well as sustaining them over a long period of time throughout the entire stroke. So let me summarize this in this figure, what I've just told you. In the normal case, in the 2D sort of case, not flapping, but in a, in, in a you know, just a flat plate uh, inclined moving through fluid. Uh, when a flat plate starts moving, uh, a leading edge force is generated. If a vortex is shed, this leading edge vortex grows in size. Eventually it grows so much that it cannot be held. Uh, it's not stable and it's shed, okay? And so there is a, there is a, uh, sort of pattern of shedding called the one comma and vortex rate. And if you notice the blue arrow here, you can see that the force goes up and down. So the force was small here, went high, then came down again. In the flapping wing, what you see is that in the initial part, it's the same as here. That shouldn't surprise us because you know, in, in small uh, um, increments, a flapping wing approximates a, uh, a pre, uh, translating wing, but as the wing continues, it stays, the vortex stays small, but stable. Uh, and then it re reaches this configuration, okay? And this is, you know, a steady configuration. So in other words, the quasi-steady model should have worked, okay? The fact that it didn't work was surprising because in theory, it was actually, uh, you know, valid. The only problem with it was that it was using coefficients that were much too small. The coefficients of lift and drag were under one. And if you were to uh, adjust those values, then uh, the mystery of how in six fly uh, is solved. So I'll just show you a movie of how this uh, translating wing works. And you can see that there's a leading edge. It's sort of a quick movie, but um, you, you get the picture. So, this diagram shows the difference between what was being done before. This is from uh, Steve Vogel's paper, uh, where he looked at, he used the old coefficients and you can see that the new coefficients now uh, were, you know, 
substantially higher and they uh, then are able to explain uh, the magnitudes of the forces that you actually observe uh, using devices like RoboFlow. And so this, uh, this uh, figure tells you all about, uh, you know, what an actual wing movement looks like, the forces on it, uh, and what I'm showing you here in red is the actual force traces that we saw. And in the blue was what the quasi-steady uh, forces uh, predicted. And as you can see, the magnitudes are beginning to match, but there's still uh, parts of the force that were not being predicted. And so these were the novel parts. These were the new mechanisms uh, that we then could uh, describe in our paper. And I won't go into all of these different mechanisms, but suffice to say that uh, you know the the one major mechanism is of course the absence of delayed stall or the leading edge vortex based mechanism that Charlie described. Then there are the rotational components when the wing uh, rotates. There is an additional force, uh, and we've uh, worked a fair bit on that as well. And then when the wing rotates and essentially bangs into the wake of its previous stroke then there is an additional force component that you get from it. And so when you put all of this picture together, you can actually um, do a pretty good job of uh, getting the time sequence right. So this is work as, uh, you know, this is sort of has continued. Uh, there are many uh, computational fluid dynamic models of this uh, through the years and we sort of understand how insects fly now. Uh, there's still many minor mechanisms that uh, continue to be described and they are uh, interesting, but for the most part, uh, the story uh, is uh, complete. So what remains to be done? Well, one of the things that remains to be done is questions that relate to how insects fly in normal environments. How does it fly in turbulent environments? And this is work that is now ongoing. The, the device uh, that we built, this is now housed in Purdue University at a collaborator's lab, uh, is uh, a modification of the RoboFly uh, in which we have um, uh, two series of sort of turbulence generators. And the question we ask is, does flapping uh, give additional advantages to insects and birds in flying in turbulent air. And we know this because insects that migrate fly at very high altitudes where air is quite turbulent. So how, how is it able to do this? And so this is work that we're doing and I'll just give you uh, the punchline in this. I won't describe it too much in detail. But if you look at the top figure and the lower figure, the left one is uh, one phase of the wing stroke. This, the right one is another phase of the wing stroke. And this is the flow around the wing stroke using particle uh, image velocimetry. The top wing is a wing moving in quiescent flow, meaning it, it's still oil. There is nothing, there's no movement in the oil. Uh, whereas the bottom one is when we have started the turbulence generators on. And you can see that both these pictures are remarkably similar. In other words, with or without turbulence, we are able to see that the wing generates the same kind of flow, and that's shown in these uh, in these uh, plots here. Uh, the red and the blue are laminar versus turbulent, and you can see that in both cases the flows, uh, the lift coefficients and the drag coefficients are the same. And that's because uh, when a wing moves and flaps, what it does is it uh, creates a certain history around itself, it uh, a bubble, if you will. Uh, of induced flow, and uh, it is then flying in that flow, and that causes mitigation of external turbulence. Um, so, the challenge now is, of course, to ask, you know, how how insects move in uh, complex uh, environments. So, here's a typical chase. You know, everything we've done so far is insects doing simple things uh, or just wings doing simple things. But here's an insect chasing another insect. And you can see that these are extraordinarily uh, fantastic chases and they're happening in three dimensions. Uh, and this is every bit as exciting as a, as a 
cheetah going after a gazelle. And as you can see, these are just territorial chases, two males essentially uh, trying to figure out who's the king of the hill uh, in order to impress the females. Uh, but when they do get a female, it's, it's a much gentler animal that you see. Here's the, this is a common housefly carrying a female housefly. Gently, she's not even flying. So this one is generating force for both of them. And then he'll gently place her on this object and then take off. And you'll see that just as it takes off, in, immediately the wing amplitude goes down. There you go. So insects are able to do all these amazing things in, in real life. And I, um, you know, this, this is really where we should now apply the knowledge that we've got to try and understand how they generate maneuvers. So before I go into the next part of my talk, I just want to get a sense of how much time I have left because I think I lost a little time. Um, okay, uh, you can take 15 minutes. 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Yeah, that should be more than plenty. Uh, and then maybe we can take questions at the end. Okay? Yes. So, I want to next talk about the mechanics of flight, the biomechanics of flight. In other words, move away from questions about fluid mechanics and talk about uh, how the insect body is configured. And as it turns out, it's an extraordinarily complex system. But as you'll see, physics is required even there, okay? Uh, so what I'm first going to show you is uh, a micro CT image of an insect. So this is the head the thorax and the abdomen, and there, there are the, you know, the wings. And what we're doing is doing an X-ray uh, imaging of this insect. And I just want you to see this movie. Uh, if it works, oh my God, okay, it doesn't work. Um, well, never mind. Um, can you still see my slides? Yes. Okay. We will, uh, we will uh, skip over this. Uh, I have another movie like this later. Um, no, maybe I should just, let me just uh, show you this movie. Uh, I think I had fixed this problem, but... Um, I forgot to save it. Okay, uh, can you see this? Yes. Yes, the movie yes. Work? yes, it's ro rotating, okay. yes. So here's the um, insect. Uh, as you can see, um, so we are looking from the back of the thorax of this insect. But what I want you to see is just how intricate its construction is from inside. So as we go in, you'll see these are muscles, all the flight muscles. Uh, you can see many different things, trachea, these are the, an, another set of muscles, and there's also a nervous system here. So you can actually see a lot uh, in movies like this. And this is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit. Now uh, we'll go it's in slice by slice, and you can see how clear this image is because it's X-ray. Uh, so the resolution is really good. And you can see also the nervous system, it sort of goes, like so, right there, uh, this, this thing here. And uh, these are the flight muscles. And these are the muscles that need to contract for the wing to move up and down, okay? And what these muscles do, as you can see, they're attached to the thorax. Uh, so they vibrate the thorax, and then the thorax, the vibration of the thorax is translated through a wing hinge which is one of the most complex structures that at least I know. Um, and somehow those vibrations then uh, are converted into wing movements. And one of the big questions in our field is how does this system work? Okay, We can see that it's an extraordinary, extraordinary um, big complex system. Okay. Now, 
flies have the structures. Now, when I say flies, there's a class of insects that uh, that have um, only one pair of wings. Most insects have two pairs of wings, but flies, like mosquitoes, are flies. House flies are flies. You know, um, Drosophila are flies. These kinds of insects have one pair of wings, and the hind pair has converted into a structure. They, they, they've reduced and they convert into a structure called Haltia. And this structure is a, a mechanosensor. In other words, what if you zoom down at the base of the Haltia, so Haltia is just behind the wing right there, you'll see it in a little bit. Then you see these little bumps, looks like corn on the cob. Uh, and you can see that each of this bump uh, is a mechanosensor, okay? It's, a single neuron, and these are a collection of neurons that are able to sense the strain on this structure as this uh, thing goes back and forth. And from that strain, they somehow compute how the insect, how fast the insect is turning. Okay, this is something we don't fully understand how it works, but uh, the idea is that it acts like a like a gyroscope. Okay, so uh, let me just show you uh, how this hortia looks. So this is a soldier fly. Uh, it has wings and haltiers are right behind. And you'll see as this insect flies, the haltiers move with the wings, but exactly in opposite phases the wings, okay? This insect flies at about 100 times a second. So we got interested in how is it that an insect is able to move its wings and haltiers with such precise synchrony in such rapid time scales. Now I told you that the Hortiers uh, are like gyroscopes. So what they do is they vibrate in a plane. And when you take the entire insect and turn it around, then there is an externally imposed change in its plane of rotation, which it tries to conserve, uh, your conservation of angular momentum. And so that causes a force at the base, uh, which is called the Coriolis force. And that is sensed by these strain sensors that I just described. And that information is then con conveyed by these neurons to the flight motor neurons, okay, to the muscles um, of the wings, which then make the corrective maneuver. So if an insect is advertent inadvertently turned, then uh, it very quickly knows that it has turned and, and it will make the corrective uh, wing uh, movements to set itself back. Now, hortiers are very important. It, they sort of, you can imagine them to be sort of like our inner ear system. So if our inner ear system doesn't work properly, then, you know, we have vertigo. We are unable to balance. You can still walk. If you hold on to objects, you can walk. But uh, you'll, you'll have a, like a chucker uh, dizziness. And hortiers do the same, except, you know, they are much faster and they are serving animals that are moving around in three dimensions. So here's what a normal insect looks like when it flaps, or when it flies, so it takes off. And um, as you can see, it's flying beautifully. It's very controlled. But if you now uh, cut the hortiers of an insect, this is what it looks like. Okay, so watch this movie now. As you can see, it's unable to control its flight. It's like a drunken fly. It can fly, but it is not able to control its trajectory. And the reason it can't control its trajectory is because it is not getting the information about its own rotations. Things are happening too fast, uh, and it becomes very quickly unstable. If you, if you just uh, uh, cut the left haltier, then the insect will turn rightwards. So you can see that it rotates in one direction, yeah? And if you cut just the right halt here, then it does the opposite. This is true for house flies, not necessarily for all flies. It depends uh, on how fast their wings move, et cetera. And as shown here, the left and right wing move in perfect synchrony and the uh, wings and the halt ears move perfectly uh, anti-phase to each other. So we thought that this must be uh, something like a reflex in which the wing sensory neurons uh, tell the wing motor neurons how to, sorry, the, the Hortier sensory uh, 
uh, wing sensory neurons talk to the Hortier motor neurons or the Hortier sensory neurons talk to the wing motor neurons. Motor neurons are the ones that uh, move the muscles. Uh, but then we also thought that there is also a possibility that the two uh, operate uh, without need for the nervous system, that they are just mechanically connected. This is where the physics comes in. And so this can be seen in this movie. So, uh, so this was an easy hypothesis to test. And my graduate student, Tanvi Devra, uh, began to test this. And what she showed was that this, is, this, uh, this hypothesis is easy to test because uh, you can test it even in dead flies. So this is a series of experiments we call the dead bug experiments. And what she showed was that in a dead fly, you could move the wing. Sorry. Uh, let me play that again. So as you can see, when you move the wing, the haltier moves exactly out of phase. Yeah. Uh, let me play that again. Um, This is the dead. So what that told us was that we didn't need um, the nervous system for this to work out. Okay. So the question was, how is it able to do this? And uh, our obvious um, guess was that they must be linked mechanically. And so we decided to figure out what these linkages were. Yeah. So here is the thorax of the insect. There is a structure on it called the scutellum. This is called the scutum. And uh, as you can see, the scutellum uh, connects to the wing bases, the two wing bases. So what you will now see uh, in the next five minutes, this video is about that long, uh, is uh, the series of experiments that we did and what we found out about these linkages. So let me start. And uh, please tell me if you can hear the sound. This movie summarizes our findings. Can you hear the sound? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Let me start. On the biomechanics of wing and hortier coordination in flies. Our study shows that precise coordination between wings and hortier is achieved not by the nervous system, but by mechanical connections within the thorax. A structure on the thorax, the scutellum, links the two wings. Rapid coordination of the indirect asynchronous flight muscles drive the motion of the scutellum, which causes simultaneous in-phase movement of both wings. When this link is severed, the two wings become uncoordinated as shown in the next video. Thus, the scutellar linkage is necessary for wing-wing coordination. Although the two wings are not coordinated anymore, the hortiers on each side oscillate antiphase to the ipsilateral wing. When the two wings become uncoordinated, the hortiers also become mutually uncoordinated. We next showed that the wing hortier coordination is mediated by a separate mechanical linkage, the subepimeral ridge, which connects the wing base to the hortier base. When the subepimeral ridge is intact, the wings and hortiers oscillate exactly antiphase with respect to each other. However, when this link is lesioned, wings and hortiers become uncoordinated. Notice that the hortier continues to move through its full amplitude driven by the asynchronous hortier muscles. The hortier on the right side, whose link remains intact as an internal control, continues to oscillate exactly antiphase with the contralateral wing. Thus, the subepimeral linkage between the wing and the hortier system on both sides are independent of each other. If the wings and hortiers are constrained to move in synchrony by mechanical linkages, how do insects achieve control of just one wing at a time? To address this question, we propose the hypothesis that there exists a clutch at the base of each wing, which can engage and disengage the wing from the mechanical linkages. When the clutch is engaged on both sides, the two wings flap together.
However, when the clutch is disengaged on one side, one wing remains folded whereas the other can flap. Apart from the clutch, the base of the wing contains a gearbox. Once the wing is engaged, the gearbox controls the amplitude of each wing. If we zoom into the base of the fly wing during active flapping, we can see the wing hinge. I should say that these movies are very difficult to get because they are, you know, focusing on a very tiny part of the insect. It consists of a radial stop shown in red, a plural wing process shown in yellow, and Terale C, a putative mechanic sensor and damper shown in blue. The radial stop contacts plural wing process in four different modes. Mode 0, 1, 2 and 3 as shown here. In this scanning electron microscope image, we see how the radial stop connects with the plural wing process in four different ways from mode 0 to mode 3. Here is a video of the wing engagement at the start of flight as the radial stop moves from mode 0 to higher modes. Notice the shift in the wing amplitude from very low to very high within a single wing stroke. So it's in mode 0 now and uh, the wing came up to there. And now it engages and you can see that the wing has moved much more. So the amplitude... Once engaged, the wing hinge shifts between the different modes and the wing moves at high amplitudes. This is akin to the gear change operation in automobiles. During flight cessation, the wing abruptly transitions from high amplitudes to low amplitudes within a wing stroke as seen in this video. When this happens, the radial stop moves from higher modes to mode zero. So what we have at the end of all of this is a model that looks sort of like this, uh, in which the indirect flight muscles, which I showed you, uh, connect to the thorax, sorry, uh, uh, and they move the thorax, uh, and then the mechanical linkages uh, make sure that the two wings move in synchrony and the wings and halteers move exactly out of phase. Um, this whole structure is actually very complex. And so I'm going to show you another movie just to give you a sense of how complex this is. Um, you know, this is the side of the insect, and we are going to see, look inside the uh, the wing hinge and uh, look at its many different parts. Okay, so um, again, this is uh, micro CT. Yeah, so here's the radial stop. This is the part of the wing that connects with the gearbox. Uh, this is the care box here. This is the scutellum liver arm, which connects the two bases. And these are these structures called sclerites. They're basically plates on the thorax that are controlled by muscles. So this particular plate called axillary sclerite one is controlled by two muscles. Then there is a second axillary plate which doesn't have muscles. A third one uh, called the axillary sclerite three uh, which uh, is controlled by uh, these muscles that are being shown. There's a four muscles. Uh, they call three, one, three, two, three, three, and three, four. Uh, and then uh, axillary sclerite four, which is uh, controlled by many uh, muscles, so about five of them. Uh, and you can see that these system of muscles, there's another one right here, basal sclerite. Uh, this is a large muscle that moves this. These are the muscles that are making sure that the wing goes through the subtle motions, you know, change in angle of attack, et cetera, et cetera, that you see 
uh, on an ongoing basis. So the back and forth motion is happening because of the big muscles, the indirect flight muscles. And these muscles, and you can imagine how complex the nervous system has to be to be able to control all of these muscles in very short time scales. And they are the ones that are orchestrating the fine movements of the wing, okay? And so what we can do is actually reconstruct this whole thing. We can even 3D print this and we can, you know, get a really nice feel of how the wing is organized, a uh, wing hinge is organized. Uh, there have also been studies uh, in my previous lab, uh, Mike Dickinson's lab, et cetera, where they've recorded from these muscles. So you actually can get a sense of what the activity patterns are. And now with Drosophila model systems, you can even visualize them as they uh, are in action. Um, so let me just say a few quick words about miniaturization and then I'll stop. Um, so here's that, here's an insect that we have been now studying. This is called trichogramma. And you can see this is uh, not as small as the insect that I showed you before, but it's quite small. It, this, it, this is about half a millimeter in size. Uh, and it has these wonderful wings and flies really well. And it has eyes um, that have poor resolution because beyond a point you can't make uh, an eye smaller and yet it is able to fly and as you can see when this insect flies these are very difficult videos to get because the animal is so tiny um, and yet you can see that they fly perfectly well uh, and uh, you know the, it is coming to light now uh, some recent papers that these kind of wasps may be actually even as numerous or more numerous than beetles, so that they might be a bulk of what the insect uh, population is. Uh, and so, you know, these are really, really important. They're so small, in fact, that they live inside the eggs of other insects. There are many challenges to miniaturization and we are very interested in pursuing this. This is where we are going next. Um, you know, how do the antennae function? Because they'll have fewer segments, fewer sensilla, so, you know, harder to smell, harder to see, harder to generate wing forces uh, because, you know, the, the wings are much smaller uh, and uh, the air is relatively more viscous uh, for these wings. Uh, how to move about uh, from one part of the world to another to find mates, food, etc. How do their flight muscles work? How does the thorax work? All of these are open questions. Um, and just one final point, which is that uh, there are now several labs uh, across the world which are uh, beginning to use these, uh, uh, these, the results coming out of such studies to build little robotic insects. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, movie won't work, but uh, I encourage you to go and look at this paper uh, by Growl et al. Uh, they uh, published it in Science in 2016. And here, what they have here is a independently controllable insect that can go and perch onto something uh, like a leaf or something like that. And uh, now even the wires have come out. So it, lots of progress being made. So I think I've run over time, so I'll stop here. Actually, one last thing I did want to talk about and I'm not going to talk about uh, is the crisis that we face uh, in the world of insects. So if you may, have read or not, I don't know, but uh, I, I feel it's very important to tell you that it, insects are getting massively decimated because of our agricultural practices, because of climate change, because of the conditions that you've, you've created. And as with uh, the COVID epidemic, I think ultimately the fingers point back to us and the way we live, uh, then we are beginning to see this uh, extraordinary uh, you know, accounts of insect declines. And if this continues, then that will be a far greater crisis uh, than COVID because uh, decimation of insects means that there will be no pollinators and all ecosystems will start collapsing. So I, I think it's an extraordinarily important topic that uh, I wish I could talk more about, but uh, please read up about it uh, because there's very, very, uh, uh, disturbing headlines. This is an article from New York Times 
which called this insect apocalypse. And these are some accounts of how uh, things that eat insects are also dying as a result. Um, and last, and what really pains me is, is the fact that monarch butterflies are going extinct. Uh, not all monarch butterflies, but this migrating populations. And that too is uh, because of uh, the uh, practices that we have uh, been following. And so we're trying to also help out in these surveys. Uh, so I won't uh, go into that. I just stop here uh, by saying that, you know, these are all the areas we work in. A lot of students have actually contributed to the work that I've talked about. Some of it is uh, work from our lab, uh, some of it from my PhD, and uh, much of it that I have not talked about. There's a lot more that uh, I could say. But here's my lab, and uh, there's a very happy lab when we, uh, I have them to thank for, um, for all of this. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Um, there are some questions, and yes. uh, can we take them? Yes, yes, please. So, first question is from YouTube uh, platform. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rajaraman Ganesh has asked: Is the physics of insect flying and that of bird flying is the same? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, no, there are subtle differences. So, birds also uh, have uh, operate over many scales. Uh, so if you look at a small bird, like hummingbird, or what we see here are sunbirds, then they are very much like insects. We call them honorary insects because their flight is very much like insects. But if you look at uh, flight of birds such as eagles or uh, vultures or um, you know large birds like that, then uh, they are much more like the fixed uh, wing aircraft such as gliders or aeroplanes uh, than like insects. So um, I'd say the answer is that smaller birds are more like insects, but the larger ones uh, that flap less and soar more are more like gliders. Second, second question uh, is from Ketan Kumar Gaikwad. Mm -hmm. Does the thermodynamic parameters like atmospheric pressure, temperature, etc affect the dynamics of insect flight? Um, yes, in an indirect way. Uh, I mean, insects are sensitive to temperatures. They are animals just like us. Uh, so in that sense, yes, because the nervous system will uh, be affected. And if the nervous system is affected, then their wing motion is affected. The physics is also affected uh, in subtle ways, but uh, you know, not enough. Uh, to write home about. I think the, the, the influence is much more um, biological uh, than thermodynamic. Okay. Uh, next question is from Suman Puranik. Mm -hmm. We have flocking bird models like VSEC model mm -hmm. based on the interaction between birds in a large group. Uh -huh. we, we have similar models for fishes also. Uh -huh. So do we have same for insects? If yes, then what are the possible parameters on which those models are mostly dependent? That's an excellent question. So formation flight as in birds is, is very different. You, in insects, we almost don't see it. We don't see insects fly in a specific formation. Um, however, you will notice that there are mosquitoes uh, that form like a hive above your head uh, when you, uh, you know, when you walk out in certain kinds of, uh, seasons. Uh, and that's because they are all uh, responding to a systemic cue. And that cue is carbon dioxide that is coming out of your uh, out of your mouth and nose. And that carbon dioxide uh, is what they are attracted to, because that's a sign that there must be mammals around. And so they all individually come to this signal. And what you see then is a hive. And so what they do is they come there, and then they just avoid each other. And so what you get is an emergent hive. Uh, it is not a formation flight. And so uh, the model that uh, is described, that would be described for insects would be very, very different indeed as compared to fish or birds in which you know they actually mean to fly in a specific formation, that they position themselves relative to each other. In insects, my feeling is that they mostly just 
avoid bumping into each other, but otherwise don't care of a, a larger formation. They're more like starlings. Okay. Uh, next question is from Chintamani. Mm -hmm. What is the role played by surface morphology of the wings and mm -hmm. mechanical properties of the wing mm -hmm. during insect flight? Mm -hmm. And second question, uh, can surface wing patterns on wings contribute to airflow patterns generated during the flight? Uh, again, a very good question. So uh, insect wings are slightly corrugated. Uh, so, you know, that has very, very small effect. Uh, remember that the Reynolds numbers at which insects operate are, are quite low, uh, at, at which levels corrugation shouldn't make too much of a difference. It's a little bit, but not too much. Um, so surface structures such as little hair, etc., almost don't matter. Uh, uh, the material matters a lot, uh, and that's what makes an insect more or less wing insect wing more or less flexible. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know that that is uh, quite an interesting uh, topic of study in and of itself, uh, which is how wing flexibility affects the aerodynamics. And we've done some work in this area, and it is also an active area of work for many other labs uh, besides us. Next question uh, is from Ambarish. Some insects have antennas. Is the working of antennas and wing movement related? Oh, that's a very nice question. That's actually a, the main topic of research in my lab is how antennal mechanosensory feedback affects wing movement. And uh, the short answer is yes, it does. And uh, you know, we feel that in insects, which is actually I told you that flies have hot ears. The hind wings have reduced into these uh, knobby mechanosensory structures. But the question remains, how do insects that don't have hot ears, so all other insects which have two pairs of wings, how do they uh, manage to get the same kind of feedback? And the short answer is, it comes from the hind. The next question is from Weber out. Can we make a complex muscle system of insects with the recent development of 3D printing of organs and demonstrate the mechanics? Uh, in principle, yes. Uh, although I think, I suspect that what we, that that method wouldn't tell us anything new. I mean, what we put into it is what we'll get out. Uh, so we can at best reconstruct uh, how it works in insects, but it won't yield any new hypothesis because the actual system is very, very complex. And so, you know, you have to conduct those studies on real insects in very controlled fashion. Uh, next question is from Rajendra More. Are flying birds or insects able and can give the sign of probable rain or earthquake, et cetera? Uh, there's some work on how insects are and birds are able to, um, you know, they, they'll often change their behavior just a little before rains, uh, seasonally speaking. But there was actually an, ins uh, an interesting study that was carried out on ants uh, as an earthquake was happening. There was this uh, scientists who were recording movements of these ants and suddenly a major earthquake happened and they just continued recording. Uh, and long and short is their studies didn't see any difference in the way the ants were going about their life. So, um, so the short answer is not really. I mean, they, they may uh, sense changes in humidity and uh, you know, accordingly prepare to sort of store food in case of bees, et cetera. Uh, or ants, but uh, you know that's something that they do uh, through the seasons also. Termites Next. also do that. Thank you. Next question is from Rahul Yadav. Do columnic uh, cavity and bilateral symmetry have anything to do with the flight of anthropoda? Silomic. Um, Silomic. Silomic cavity, uh, well, I mean, not really. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it exists. It's in a highly reduced form uh, in insects. 
because insects have a um, a nice exoskeleton that gives them structure in uh, in animals that don't have structure the silomic cavity acts as the um, as the sort of uh, hydrostatic skeleton uh, so the silomic cavity doesn't really have much of a role to play in insect flight uh, what was the second part of that silomic cavity and bilateral symmetry bilateral symmetry is of course important you know two wings uh, you know but yeah so yeah it is important Um, but Bindu, it is what it is bindu madam has said uh, uh, thank you for your excellent talk and ask a question mm -hmm. why is it some uh, that some insect have buzzing sound for example mosquito mm -hmm. uh, that has all to do with the rate at which they uh, flap their wings now mosquitoes flap their wings at an astonishingly high rate so that's close to 400 to 500 times a second Uh, the insects that i showed you are really fast but mosquitoes are even faster and there are midges that will go up to 1000 hertz so uh and how they do that and the you know thoracic structure i haven't really gone into that I, i i could have talked for another hour about that but the mosquitoes um are flapping at very high rate so the pitch is higher and that's why you hear them. next question is from again rahul yadav the chitinous what is that chitinous yeah chitinous exoskeleton has uh -huh. has no moisture does uh -huh. that deprive the drag and resist the dynamics of flight um not really i mean it acts like a flat plate uh moisture doesn't contribute much to this anyway in fact uh, it helps for it not to have moisture because it's hydrophobic which means that uh you know it doesn't get wet and its material properties don't change uh and they can be quickly uh you know thrown off um next question can we measure force coefficient for more than angle of attack 90 degree in complex case uh yes but it wouldn't tell you anything too different i mean it, you know the first of all insects never go above 90 degrees in fact they don't even go as high as 90 degrees uh so it's unrealistic which is partly why we haven't done it but also you know the it's predictable what what would happen and once you sort of know uh the major components uh, in force uh generation then everything else is predictable This is the question from Rinku Das. Uh, how did you measure the angle of flight of an insect? Angle of flight, uh, the body angle. Must be the body angle. Uh, what you do is you digitize uh, the head and the tip of the abdomen, and uh, you have a reference, uh, and you just keep track of how the inclination of that line that connects wing to abdomen, uh, the head. tip to abdomen changes uh relative to the reference object it's pretty simple this is the question from hari pages uh why do the haltiers move antiphase to the wings how exactly do they function as uh -huh. gyroscopes hmm so those are two different questions for the answer to the first question is in most insects they move antiphase to the wings not in all insects okay so in mosquitoes for instance they move in some fixed phase relative to the wings okay. in every case they move in some fixed phase relative to the wings in every case that you know i have talked about those mechanical connections are important it's it's fundamental to their flight um but it may not always be antiphase to the wing now as to why they move antiphase to the wings what i didn't tell you is that we have now proposed a model of uh, the wing and haltier system as a dual forced oscillator system okay and that kind of a system settles into certain modes of vibration but one of those modes is and the wings are antiphase to each other the two oscillators are antiphase to each other so one oscillator is wings the other is haltier and so we think that this is just uh, you know 
dictated by the physics of uh, vibrations. Uh, ne next question is from Advait. How far insects can see? If not, then how that affects the flight? Okay, how far insects can see? So, you know, there is a silly answer to that question is they can see very far. Uh, they can see the sun, for instance. But that's not what uh, I think he's asking. What he's asking is what is the resolution of the eye? Um, the resolution of the eye uh, is actually much less than uh, the human eye, for instance, uh, because the compound eye is such that the number of facets on the eye uh, range from, you know, few tens in very small insects uh, to few thousands uh, in large insects, tens of thousands. Uh, and so, you know, it's still very, very less as compared to what our eyes can do. So the insect visual resolution, in, in other words, its ability to distinguish uh, two different points as being separate is not very good. It's one or two degrees uh, in some of the better resolved insects. Dragonflies might be a little better than that, uh, but by, not by a whole lot. There is one question left of Vaishali uh, yeah. from YouTube by Rajendra Mori. Are flying birds or insects able and can give the sign of probable rain or no, earthquake? That was us. That was us. That was us. That was us. Achha, earlier it was. Hmm. This is the question from Shivani. I have heard that according to the their point of view, that means insect point of view, the time is very slow. Is it true? Oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in, in a sense, yes, because the rate at which they operate is very fast. So, you know, let's just think of this in some specific terms, okay? Um, when you and I look at a television screen, and I'm talking now of the old televisions, you know, where uh, the CRTs and so on, uh, you know, the, the, the television screen was updated uh, at the rate of something like 25 times a second or something like that, okay? Or slightly higher than that. Uh, a standard movie runs at about 20 to 25 frames a second. And to us, this looks continuous. To an insect, it would not look continuous, okay? Because their refresh rates are much faster than us. Um, and so they would see each different image as a separate image. So in that sense, yes, their uh, you know their sense of time is is faster than ours. Uh, this is uh, you know this is why it is so hard to swat an insect because they see you coming long before you know uh, you even know. They they are extremely perceptive, and for them, uh, our hands are moving very slowly uh, as compared to how fast they operate. There are two more questions. Can we take? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. yes, yes. If the insects ripple, uh, ripple among themselves, then how mi migration of a large group of insects over the globe been done? Mm. That's that's a very interesting question. Actually, um, they they, are, they they undergo specific changes. So, let's take the example of locusts. You know, locusts exist in two forms. There is a solitary form and there is a gregarious form. Now the solitary form has to undergo physiological changes to become gregarious. The solitary form avoid each other. They don't, uh, you know, they don't aggregate. And so they are just in and around us like grasshoppers, you know, they are not really uh, doing much. But then they go through a change. Uh, this is partly mediated by serotonin and there's a neuromodulator that um, causes a change. In fact, they change the color even. And this then causes a, a diametrically opposite shift in its behavior, which means that now the locusts start to seek each other and they start to aggregate. And then they become, they start to march together and eventually take off and we get this extraordinary, uh, you know, uh, locust uh, formations that are flying, not formations, but you know, uh, uh, you know, locust attacks that we've seen in recent times. Uh, this happened because of uh, them converting into this uh, 
gregarious form. So insects are, you know, thinking, feeling creatures. They will change their behavior under certain circumstances. This is the last question from uh, Atul Modi, sir. Mm -hmm. How does migratory butterfly decide to migrate? I mean, physical conditions. Yes, that's a very interesting question. And we don't fully under understand uh, all, all the parameters that go into it. Uh, but what is certainly true is that it is um, able to, um, you know, it is able to uh, sense uh, certain things like, you know, change in daylight, uh, um, you know, pattern that indicates that a certain season is starting, for instance. Um, you know, there's many different uh, cues that allow them to um, sense that seasons are changing, um, temperature is changing, they can sense temperature. Um, so they are very uh, perceptive that way. Uh, and this changes their behavior. That's when they decide to take off. One more question. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, yeah, the, tell me. From the vector diagram about effect of turbulence on wing motion, mm -hmm. <coughs> could you please explain it once more? Okay, let's uh, go back. So what you see, the top two images are velocity fields okay, uh, of, um, so the arrows are velocity fields, uh, if you can see, of wings in quiet fluid, okay, with fluid with no turbulence. The bottom two, C and D, are uh, images of a wing in turbulent flow. So we've generated turbulence in the flow. And what we do is we get the wing to move a few times so that uh, a certain flow is established around it. And we start to take these images. Okay, And the point that we make, now you can see uh, that there are some differences in the top and lower image. There is some uh, maybe additional noise in the lower image uh, as compared to the top image. Some structures are smeared out. But by and large, they look very similar, right? This vortex, for instance, has you know, dissipated uh, because of noise or whatever. Uh, in general, the vortices are not as intense. Uh, they get a little bit averaged up. But what is surprising is the fact that they actually are quite similar to each other. You wouldn't expect a wing in turbulence to be able to generate lift. Uh, but not only is this wing generating lift, it's doing so very similar to a wing in quiet fluid. And we think the reason for that is that as the wing moves, it begins to induce flow around itself. And the, the flow that it induces, self-induces, uh, fights turbulence or mitigates turbulence. And that causes the turbulence to become less proportionally and uh, the wing to be moving uh, in its own flow, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, imagine that you are swimming in a swimming pool and let's say that the swimming pool is turbulent. And what you do is you move your hands very fast. And when you move your hands very fast, what you do is you recruit fluid from around your immediate surrounding, which comes in and sort of forms a flow around yourself. And now you're swimming in that flow. Okay. And that flow is much more laminar than the, uh, the fluid that is outside, which is kind of turbulent. And this is seen in this right diagram where you know, uh, the laminar values are in red, and the turbulent values are in blue. And you can see this is the lift uh, or drag coefficient. So this is the lift coefficient plot. This is the drag coefficient plot. And you can see that you know, there is some variability uh, as one would expect, but the values by and large are right on top of each other. In other words, the insect is quite effective at flying in turbulence. I think uh, all the questions are over. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir, for this wonderful talk. And we th humans think that we are the <laughs> complex structured animal on the earth.
the yeah. structure of uh, uh, this uh, insects and their flights mechanism it's uh, very complex to understand <laughs> but yes. in a very lucid manner you have explained it thank you thank you very much sir over thank to you rekha madam yeah um, thank you vaishali um, uh, i may i call upon now uh, professor amit more to present a word of pratibha uh, rekha yeah. madam yeah yeah one, uh, point it yeah. was amazing Yeah, thank you, madam. We know now why physics people fly. <laughs> really amazing, and the way you explained the biology part was um, really there are no words to describe it. Too good. There is a lot and, of. And uh, you know, yeah. like we we are still thinking only in terms of Drosophila. One of my colleagues wrote to me that. <laughs> but there there are many many uh, systems which you can work with, and the way you explained very simple. Uh, people like me could also understand and uh, thank you so much it was too good maybe rekha one oh. more session we'll have for the yes, third yes. students sure. you know like sure, zoology sure. students yeah yes they will see this youtube also yes. but mm -hmm. uh, it was too good okay. especially okay. simulations and all very good very good too good thank you, thank you so much it was very nice thank you thank you thank madam you. Uh, actually uh, we our Uh, you know uh, objective is to tell students that there is a lot of potential in interdisciplinary work so um, physics students can encroach upon biology and biology students also can encroach upon physics and together i think they can may have create wonders um, we have participants from all over the country yes, madam yes. iit karakpur yeah and another thing is that we have from uh, people from zoology also uh, the today not only physicists but even zoologists have joined i can see that okay thanks everyone uh, i i just want to make the point that you know uh, when you're studying animals animals don't particularly care about whether something is physics or whether something is biology they just yes, do what they do yes yes they don't yes, care about yes. these artificial boundaries we've created yes yes we have created yeah. them yeah <laughs> Uh, over to you, Amit. Uh, please. Uh, yeah. yeah. So good evening. It was indeed a great, uh, wonderful, and uh, enriching experience to listen, Dr. Sanjay Sani sir. Uh, I'm sure each and every participant has enjoyed this session. It was very interesting to know physics behind the flight of insects. Uh, rather, you know, I am very poor in mechanics, but I could able to relax myself. Uh, to some part of the you know how force is generated and how the movement takes place, uh, so it was very interesting, and uh, I can see the participants were actively engaged and they thrown so many questions, interesting questions. So that indicates uh, how you know they could be able to connect themselves with the uh, topic. So on behalf of uh, IAPT SRC Mumbai, I thank you, sir, for taking out time from your busy schedule and making it a memorable event. I thank Hindi Vidya Prachar Samiti, Ram Niranjan Junjunwala College Management Principal for their constant support, and Department of Physics for uh, taking the initiative and uh, organizing uh, hosting this uh, lecture series. Uh, I also uh, thank the non-teaching and the technical support for doing all necessary arrangements. I thank the president of uh, IPT. for proposing such a nice idea and constantly encouraging for uh, such kind of uh, work i thank all the participants for such a very well being uh, response thank you all stay safe stay healthy thank you so much ali thank you uh, it's time to announce our uh, next lecture of the series now uh, uh, we are going to meet again on tuesday as promised this is going to be a eighth lecture in the series uh, organized by iipt mumbai sabarasti and uh, the uh, department of physics arge college this lecture will be delivered by uh, dr dishita desai from tifr she is going to talk on the search for new physics i think it's going to be a really interesting for all of us so i request all the participants to join us on tuesday again on uh, 7th july at 4 o'clock thank you thank you once again thank you each one of you thanks Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me. This is yeah. 